Y'all lucky I can't sing. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here with you all this morning, and uh, in the absence of our pastor, um, let's be prayerful for him and his wife, wherever they are journeying uh, to, that uh, even at this hour they are getting fed and uh, relieved and getting some rest and relaxation that they need. Uh, can we give God a hand of praise for our pastor? One thing I can say about um, EBC, or this has been my experience here, is that this is a healthy place. Um, Pastor knows how to hold us accountable for the things that we need to do. Um, he and his wife know how to love on us in down times. And, um, and the people of God represent Pastor's heart. Every time I see you all out, uh, you know, you represent EBC so well, and thank you all so much for the love uh, that you show, not only uh, to each other, but to the world. Uh, this is a blessing to be a part of this body. Amen. Amen. A 97-year-old couple, been together for quite a long time, and... Um, they started noticing some things about themselves that um, were a little concerning, primarily their memory. And they decided to go to the doctor to check on themselves and just kind of get a regular checkup and just see what's going on with their memory. And so they went to the doctor, <coughs> and the doctor told them, um, he said, you know, you, you're in relatively good health physically, said, but, you know, mentally as you get older, you can expect some things to start taking a downward turn. Said, so my encouragement to you is to begin to write down some important things that you need to do throughout the course of the day. Just write it down. That way it'll help you to remember what you need to know. And they said, okay, that's a pretty good idea. I think we'll start doing that. So they went home, and later on that evening, the husband um, got up, and he looked at his wife, and he said, uh, sweetheart, he said, I'm getting ready to go to the kitchen. He said, can I bring you anything back? And she says, you know what? I've been craving some ice cream. Could you bring me a bowl of ice cream? He said, uh, yeah, I can do that. She said, um, she said, you think you need to write that down? <laughs> he said, no, uh, I, I believe I got it. You want, a, you want a bowl of ice cream? She said, well, in fact, can you put some strawberries on top of that ice cream? I'd like some strawberries with the ice cream. <laughs> and... Uh, she says, um, um, now, I think you ought to write that down. And again, he assured her, no, I, I, I've got it. I, I, know, I know what you want. You want some ice cream and you want some strawberries. And uh, she said, yeah, ooh, 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 add some whipped cream to that. <laughs> he said, okay, whipped cream. Okay, she said, now, I, I know you need to write it down now. And, of course, you know, him being a man, having his ego, he, he's a little upset at this point. He said, you know, woman, I hear what you're saying. You want some ice cream, you want strawberry toppings, and you want some whipped cream. I got it, okay? I got it. 20 minutes later, he comes back with a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> His wife looks at him, looks at the plate, looks back at him and said, See, I told you you should have written it down. You forgot the toast I asked for. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> the Bible is good for reminding us to remember. <laughs> I know those are synonyms, and oftentimes they're used interchangeably, but it's worth noting that there are some distinctions between the two. You see, to remind is to make someone think about something again. And the action of reminding always involves two, something or someone doing the reminding and the recipient of the reminder. The doctor's office reminds you of your appointment. The insurance company will remind you of your policy limits when you think they pay more. 
the gas light on your car will remind you that your tank is near empty. Reminders, something or someone doing the reminding. But to remember is to think of something from the past again. And unlike reminding, remembering involves a party of one. That's just you. I remember, as some of you do, when premium gas was 97 cents a gallon. Some of y'all are older than I am. You can remember it was much cheaper. Um, I remember the first time I bit into some beets thinking it was cranberry sauce. I still haven't forgiven my mother for that. She put those beets on my plate. I, I bit into it, and immediately, uh, you know, uh, I, I said, I, I can't eat this. She said, well, you're going to eat it, <laughs> but, I, but I can't. And, and she, she said, well, you're going to sit here at this table until you finish those beats. And so she sat, and I sat. She sat, and I sat. I looked at the beats. The beats looked at me. And I guess she had got enough of sitting, and so she went up and went to the back. And um, I don't know, she may have used a restroom or something, but if she flushed the toilet, I flushed the toilet at the same time. Because I want to make sure I wasn't going to eat those beets. <laughs> I remember that. I remember as a child in April of 84, standing on my bed, accepting Jesus Christ with my parents in front of me as my Savior and Lord. I remember that. I remember that. Um, reminders and remembering. And so today, my brothers and sisters, I'd like to talk to you about a reminder to remember the Lord. A reminder to remember the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses is reminding the Israelites to remember God. It was the Lord who had rescued them from their oppressors in Egypt. It was the Lord who had opened up for them the Red Sea and allowed them to cross on dry ground. It was the Lord who had guided them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And Moses says, as you're getting ready to enter into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, don't forget where you came from and don't forget who brought you. Remember the Lord. And for many of us here today, you can testify, just like the nation of Israel, that life has presented itself a sets of challenges and difficulties, that times have not always been so beautiful, great, grand, or good. You've had, as the song says, some lonely days and some sleepless nights, but God rich in his grace and mercy, lifted you out of your dark, dead, doomed, and dangerous, defeated circumstance. And I'm here to remind you, just like Moses reminded them, since you have reached a place of plenty, a place of safety and security, remember where you came from and remember who brought you. Remember the Lord. In chapter 2, in verse eight, chapter in chapter eight, verse two, um, 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 he says, "This is Moses." He says, "Remember, y'all, follow along with me. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these forty years to humble and test you, in order to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commands." Now Moses points out three parts that are worth considering. Under God's direction, Moses says, number one, remember God will lead you all the way. Isn't it comforting to know that our God never gets lost? That he never loses his footing or his bearing? And he promises that he won't forsake or forget those who follow him because in Hebrews 13 and 6, God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. It was Billy Graham who said these encouraging words, and I'm paraphrasing. God's will won't take you where his grace can't keep you. God will lead you all the way. But then number two, remember, God will lead you through uncharted territory. It's all there in verse two. It says, remember 
how the Lord your God led you all the way. Where? In the wilderness these 40 years. You see, the wilderness is a dry place. It's a desert place. It's an unfamiliar place. It's an undesirable place. And I don't know anybody who ever aims to be in the wilderness. And I want you to know something, brothers and sisters. The wilderness can be as much an emotional, mental, and spiritual condition as it is a physical place. Let me see if I can prove that to you. When David's men wanted to kill him because the Amalekites had taken their families and their fortunes, David was in an emotional wilderness. When King Saul disobeyed and dishonored God, the Holy Spirit detached himself from Saul, leaving him in a spiritual wilderness. And while in the belly of the whale, Jonah in chapter 2 talked about crying out to the Lord in his distress and in his anguish because Jonah was in a mental wilderness. The wilderness experiences of life can be as much emotional, spiritual, and mental as they are physical. Some of you can attest to this reality. Emotionally, you've been compromised. Spiritually, you've been challenged, and mentally, you've been wanted to check out. You've echoed, as the psalmist Ludacris said, y'all going to make me lose my mind up in here, up in here. But in the wilderness of life, whether sent or self-imposed, God proves himself to be our protector and our provider, our sustainer and our satisfier. Yeah, God will lead you all the way. God will lead you through uncharted, unfamiliar territory. But then number three, remember, while leading, God is looking at your heart. Remember that while leading... God is looking in your heart. Again, verse 2. Verse 2, we're going to put it all together here, verse 2. Um, verse 2 says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to what? Know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. You see, an entire generation of Israelites died in the wilderness because their hearts weren't right towards God. What should have taken the nation 11 days from Egypt to Canaan took them 40 years because every time God looked inside of their hearts, he saw something other than humility and thankfulness. It's right there in the Bible. In Exodus chapter 12, God liberated the Israelites and they marched out of Egypt. But by the time we make it to chapter 14, chapter 12, he liberates them, chapter 13, chapter 14. By the time we get to chapter 14, they're already crying and complaining. When God looked in their hearts, he saw something other than humility. And every believer under the sound of my voice should ask themselves this question. What does God see when he looks inside of my heart? In fact, I'm going to give you just a hot second to ask that very question. Lord, what do you see when you look inside of my heart? Because that's what he's judging. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Don't turn there right now, but when you get home, look over it. 1 Samuel chapter 16 is a very interesting chapter to me because a seasoned saint, Samuel, learns a brand new lesson. You imagine you've been walking with God all of your life. Samuel started in, in, in the temple with God a long time ago. And he learned all the things, or he thought he learned all the things that God wanted to show him. And so Samuel was sent over to the house of Jesse to anoint for God a new king over Israel. Because he had rejected King Saul. And so by the time he makes it over to Jesse's house... He begins to, Jesse begins to, to usher his sons before Samuel. And by the time he gets to son number one, Eliab, Samuel looks at Eliab and says, my goodness, this must be God's anointed. Why did he say that? Did he look inside of the man's heart? No. What he did was he looked at his appearance. He looked at his statue. 
He looked at his flowing hair. He looked at his skin tone. He looked at all of the outside stuff, and he said, this must be God's anointed. But God corrects this seasoned saint. He says, in, in essence, you know what? My friend, you've been walking with me a long time, but guess what? There are some things that you still don't know about me. While you're focusing your eyes on the external, I'm focusing my eyes on the internal. While you're looking at the man's head, I'm looking at the man's heart because I don't see what you see. I don't see what man sees. I see what I need to see, and I'm looking inside of their hearts. In the hearts. What does God see when he looks inside of your heart? Let me make that more personal. God, what do you see when you look inside of Craig's heart? Do you see humbleness? Or do you see haughtiness? Do you see humility in me, Lord? Or do you see a hard heart? Repeat this after me, brothers and sisters. Remember, God will lead me all the way. Remember, God will lead me through uncharted, unfamiliar territory. Remember, while leading, while leading, God is looking in my heart. Amen. Amen. Verse 10 through 14. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10 through 14. When you have eaten... And are satisfied. Praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In verses 10 through 14, Moses says that be sure that what should be praised doesn't turn into pride. It's important to have praise on your lips to keep from developing pride in your heart. <laughs> it's all there in the text. He says, verse 10, look at verse 10 with me. He says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Then look at verse 12. Otherwise... When you are, have eaten and are satisfied and when you build houses and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and you have, all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. God says, I'm going to uphold my end of the deal. Everything that I told Abraham that I do for his family, for his generations, I'm getting ready to do that. In verse 10, he says, you're going to eat and be satisfied. In verse 12, he says, you're going to build fine houses. In verse 13, he says, your cattle is going to be healthy and large, and your wealth is going to multiply. And he says, but when those things happen, don't forget what I said in verse 11. Well, what did he say in verse 11? Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and decrees that I'm giving you this day. He says, I'm reminding you, nation of Israel, when your bellies are full, your houses are fine, and your pockets are fat, don't act like you did this on your own, and don't allow pride to creep into your heart. Remember the Lord. The scripture here is teaching us that the remedy for pride is praise. You see, pride looks at me, but praise looks at him. Pride says, I can do this by myself, but praise says, if it had not been for the Lord on my side. 
Pride looks within, but praise says, I will look to the hills from which cometh my help because all of my help comes from the Lord. The remedy for pride is praise. Forgive me, but let me push this envelope a little further. Oftentimes, pride is more subtle than overt. I don't know any Christian, no any real Christian who would audibly say, I don't need God. But subtle pride will begin to reveal and unravel itself when you neglect to recognize or act like the need for worshiping God like you used to. And it's a sad commentary when as a believer, your past is brighter than your present. You just stop showing up for church. Your children's social life and athletic agendas take precedent and priority over praise. Your own personal activities, enjoyment, and fulfillment become more important than assembling yourselves with other believers. Turn with me real quick to, to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. In verse 23 through 25, here's how it reads. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds, watch this, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching. The day is the day when Christ shall come back. And he says, when Christ comes back, or, and as you are anticipating the return of Jesus Christ, he says, you and I need each other. He says, in fact, we need each other to spur or motivate each other along in this life's journey. The Christian life is a difficult life if you're trying to do it by yourself. But when you come to the house of the Lord, and you come to Bible study, and you come out and be a part of the things that are taking place in God's house, he says that's going to spur you towards love and good deeds. And it's important, my brothers and sisters, that we do not neglect assembling ourselves together because this is where growth takes place. Here's what happens when we worship together. Put this on the screen for me. Here's what happens when we worship together. Number one, we, 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 show, we show a display of unity and commonality. Number two, when we worship together, we show a willingness to have our worldview shaped biblically. And number three, we show the world how serious we are about the faith we profess. All of those things take place when we worship or as we worship together. But pride says, I'm good. I've got this. I don't really want to be around all them people. When the reality is we need each other because none of us has it all together. All of us face the problems of life, financial problems, health concerns, family issues, marital complications, but oftentimes God won't heal it if you refuse to reveal it. And all I'm trying to convey is that we need each other, so don't allow pride to hinder God's promises. And brothers and sisters, as I hurry to a close, it's important to remember or to know the key to remembering God is rehearsing over his goodness in your life. The key to remembering God is rehearsing over his goodness in your life. The key to remembering is rehearsing. I, I can't forget, my wife and I laugh at this now. I wasn't laughing 
two or three months ago. <sighs> My wife was a part of the praise team, and, um, you know, when, when, when the praise team is, is not a huge praise team, you know, of course, every voice counts. Uh, and every, every person in the praise team has a microphone so you can hear every voice. And so it's essential and it's important that you, you rehearse over your parts at home and wherever so you can get it all right on Sunday morning. Well, my wife had this particular song that they were singing, and it wasn't that she was rehearsing the song that bothered me, but she was rehearsing this one little old part. <laughs> and she rehearsed this part, I kid you not, 25 to 30 minutes. And I was in the back of the house, she was in the front, and all I could hear was this same song, five seconds of this song playing, and her repeating what she heard. Five seconds of the song playing, and her repeating what I heard. I'm like, my God. Don't you have it by now? I can sing it if you want me to. But I understood. Because, because, because the key to remembering is rehearsing. And over and over, Moses rehearses with the nation of Israel God's goodness in their lives in the wilderness. In verse 3 of chapter 8, he says, God fed your manna. In verse 4, he said, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't swell. In verses 7 through 9, he says, the land where you're going is filled with deep springs, wheat and barley, pomegranates, olive oil, honey, iron and copper. In verse 15, he says, he led you around venomous snakes and scorpions and even caused water to gush from the rock. He rehearses over with them the faithfulness of God. And though I'm very thankful for Moses rehearsing with the people of Israel, I've got my own song to rehearse. I remember 2009, my wife and I were in a hospital room with a few other family members. She had this nodule cyst on, on her thyroid. And after they had done the biopsy for it, they didn't think it was cancerous, but they still didn't like how it looked because they were afraid that it could develop into cancer. We had people praying. My parents were praying. Their friends were praying. And we were all praying. And, 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 and we were there at this hospital room getting ready to, to, to usher my wife in to have her thyroid removed because of this nodule. And I'll never forget, the doctor came into the room and he says, um, uh, Mr. Ms. Paula, we, we, we can't perform this surgery. Why? He says, because if we perform this surgery, it's going to create a spontaneous abortion. I'm looking at the doctor, I'm like, oh boy, what? <laughs> what we didn't know was that a few weeks earlier, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but she, she got pregnant. It's still a mystery. <laughs> but what I do know is, is that through the process of my wife's pregnancy, God healed her thyroid. <laughs> we got a double blessing. He healed her thyroid and he gave us our son here on the front row here. I'm thankful for Moses, but I can rehearse my own news. In 2020, just a couple of years ago, we were forced to shut down as a business. We own our own business, barbershop, and uh, I, I never thought I'd see the words, you're forced to close. How are you going to make me close and I got the keys? <laughs> but we were forced to close. And, and people even here at the church, knew that I was um, self-employed and, and, and some of you so graciously started pouring into 
our lives. And what I noticed was, was that when it was time to open back up, there were a lot of businesses in Shreveport and Bossier that were just permanently closed down. But God sustained us through the pandemic. That ain't, that ain't my shout. Not only did God sustain us through the pandemic, but while other people were shutting down, we were expanding. Thank you, Moses, for rehearsing over this with the Israelites. But I don't need you right now. I got my own praise. <laughs> my goodness. Listen, the benefits of rehearsing the goodness of God, I want to list these out for you. The benefits of rehearsing the goodness of God, in times of uncertainty, it kills doubt. Because what God has done before, he'll do it again. In moments of weakness, it builds confidence. In the absence of peace, it provides hope. And the benefits of rehearsing the goodness of God is, is that it serves as a witness to future generations. <laughs> when, when, when you all throughout the script, the Old Testament, you can see it. When God did something miraculous for the people or they thought there was something that was worth remembering, they would put up what they call monuments or stones of remembrance. And strategically, they would place these stones, usually 12, to indicate the 12 tribes of Israel. They would place these at certain places. And so what would happen is, is that when they get back to that place, it would automatically and immediately jar their memory and say, you know what? Wow, look what God has done. But then God said, it's not just about you. It's about the children coming behind you. So that not only when you walk by, but when you bring your little ones with you when you bring your children and your grandchildren with you and they come across these stones of remembrance, it is your opportunity to tell and rehearse what God has done for you so that your children will give God praise like you gave God praise. <laughs> I like how Moses ends this chapter because we end it much like how we began it. And just like a broken record in chapter 8, he continues to remind the children of Israel, it was the Lord who had brought you through the obstacles in the wilderness. In verses 15 and 16, he basically says, listen, dehydration should have killed you, the snakes should have bitten you, the scorpions should have stung you, and the land should have starved you out but God. And then he says in verse 17, put that up on the screen for me, verse 17, Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says in verse 17, you may say to yourself, my power and strength and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. He says, some of y'all will have an issue because you're going to start talking to yourselves. And I've always heard that it's all right to talk to yourself, but if you start answering yourself, they say you're in bad shape. Um, he says, when the times come, and you've had your fill of the land. You've eaten, you're full, you're satisfied, you've, you, you, you've done everything, you've harvested, you've done everything. He says, when the time comes, when you look at what you have and you begin to say or think to yourself, my power and strength did this, he says, be careful. Be careful. And many of you here today, you can testify to that. It's, it's not that you, you intentionally or purposely forgot God. You just, as time went along, as business got better, as the family life got better, as you grew uh, as an individual, as a person, as a corporation, as a business, you began to look at yourself and say, man, I'm doing a really good job. Business is going well. We've expanded. We've got seven stores now. I'm so good. I'm so great. I've got it going on. 
I don't need anything or anybody. He says, when you speak to yourself, remember the Lord, your God. When you start talking to yourself, EBC, and you look at your businesses, and you look at your families, and you look at your income, and when you start to develop the kind of mindset that says, look at me, immediately pause and call a time out in your life and say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where in the world would I be? <laughs> Moses reminds them to remember. EBC, you may say to yourself, my power got me this position. My education opened this door. My money got me this house. My charisma got me where I am. My charm got me my wife or husband. But I came to remind you, remember the Lord. It is he who gives you the ability to do what you do. I'm reminding you today, like a broken record, remember the Lord. I'm reminding you today that regardless of whether your ancestors walked, crossed, or were forcibly moved across the sea, God saw you through. Remember the Lord. But most importantly, I want to remind you today that your Savior died on a hill called Calvary. He hung, bled, and died for your sin and for my sin. EBC, remember the Lord. He didn't, take, he didn't come down from that cross when he could have. Remember the Lord. He could have been rescued at any point, said, Lord, God, I've got enough. Get me down. But for your sake and for my sake, he stood there. He hung, bled, and died. EBC, remember the Lord. But remember that he didn't stay dead because the Bible says on the third day he got up with all power and glory in his hands and he lives in me today and he lives in you today. EBC, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. All heads are bowed. All eyes closed, please. Broken record. Remember the Lord. When you get too full of yourself, remember the Lord. When your children are doing better than you were, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. There may be somebody here tonight, this morning. Who can say, Craig, I can attest that I've begun to look at myself instead of the Lord. There may be somebody here today who, who can say, you know what, I need to take a look back and a step back and start praising God more than what I do. I've allowed my agenda, my children's agendas, I allowed all these other things, these circumstances and distractions to get in the way of my relationship with God and I need to rectify that. I don't want to embarrass you here this morning, but I want you to look up at me if that's you. If you can honestly say that things have gotten in the way of you and your progress, your walk with the Lord. I want you to look up at me. I see you. This is you recognizing where you are. This is you saying, Lord, forgive me. This is you saying, Lord, restore me to the place where I need to be. There's nothing wrong with being in that place. There's no condemnation in that place. And even though you might have gotten blindsided by things, you're here today and you say, you know what, I need to fix that.
What a beautiful place to be in. Let me pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every person, oh Lord God, who is willing to say that I've allowed some things to hinder my praise. I've begun to forget the Lord because I'm so focused on my agenda and my priorities. Father, forgive us for that. Forgive us and make us whole. We repent right now today for not remembering you. I repent, oh Heavenly Father, personally for times in my life where I look at me and think that I'm responsible for what I have. Forgive us. Make us clean. Make us whole, oh Lord. And when we start to think of ourselves more than what we should, Help all of us here today, oh Father, to remember the Lord. (laughs) Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.